this year's Levy Medal Orator grew up on a Tikawiti sheep and beef farm, which he left school at the age of 15 to run. He then went on to do a diploma in sheep farming at Massey, as well as three months compulsory military service at Waiuru, and also spent three years in Malaysia with the BSA. He then went back to Massey, completed a, a very good BXI honours and a PhD and hasn't left. And Corey Matthew is the Professor of Agronomy at Massey University, where I understand on good authority that he has lectured <coughs> over 500 students a year and made 200 do a feed budget every year. Been the Chief Supervisor of 15 PhDs, written over 180 publications. I can't really do him justice, but um, he also incidentally spent seven years on the executive of NZGA, so the NZGA he's, he's given time to. And it's really with pleasure that I invite Corey to the stage to speak. Corey Matthew. It's a complete privilege, ladies and gentlemen, to deliver this talk to you this morning. Uh, I regret that I can't see your faces because of the way the stage is lit. I love to eyeball the audience and uh, get them excited. Uh, you'll see that I've titled my talk, Our Industry Through the Eyes of a Pastor Agronomist. Uh, with 35 years of thoughts trying to condense into half an hour, you have to be impossibly selective. Uh, so I've picked out four themes, our heritage, the science of growing grass, uh, change ever present and thinking to the future. Uh, you'll find a lot of overlap with things we've done yesterday. Uh, as I was preparing this talk, I found myself curious about Sir Bruce Levy. I've heard his name so much. Who was he? What was his career outline? Uh, I looked him up on Tiara. I found he was born in 1892. And his family had quite a poor background. His parents left him with an Auckland nurseryman uh, as, as a child. He left school at 14, uh, got a uh, civil service exam and became a junior clerk in the Department of Agriculture where he was noticed by the botanist cocaine and I guess with his nursery background, uh, went back to university and in his 30s graduated with a BSc from Victoria University and the rest is history. He became one of the first directors of DSI Grasslands in the 1930s. Um, his papers covered a huge range of topics from cultivar development to rye grass and white clover through uh, feed flavour and uh, butter through construction of bowling greens. Uh, one little quirky piece of information about Sir Bruce Levy. Uh, there's a photo from one of his papers. He published the first description of the point analysis method for uh, analysing herbage composition. Don't you love the clothes they wore those days where the technicians were doing their work? And that paper has now 315 citations and was running at about 10 citations a year. And that graph in the bottom right is the citation record over the years from 1930 when it was published through to the present time. So it's quite amazing. Uh, United States, they recognize Levy as the uh, inventor of the point analysis uh, method used in eco ecology studies around the world. These guys are my heroes. I had to slip this photo in. Uh, how preposterous to put cyclists on a boat, but doesn't it epitomize the Kiwi approach? After all, there's more power in the legs than the arms. And as we now know, the rest is history. It worked. And that's something of what we do in our industry. Uh, for me, uh, my grandfather came from Sunderland in the 1890s and built that house on the Raglan Harbour. That's my dad on the veranda with my grandfather. Uh, bush felling in those days cost 25 shillings an acre. Would you believe it? Uh, in the second generation, the money from England had been spent, so. Uh, my dad came back from the First World War and tended the farm for his widow mother for 20 years before he had enough money to propose to a girl and get married. Uh, the rabbit traps that you can just see on the wall of, uh, to the left of the door, they got dad through the slump because a bale of wool sent to Auckland 
uh, from Tikawiti in the uh, 1929 and 1930. Wouldn't realize enough money to cover the cabbage, but you could get frappings for a rabbit skin and have enough money to buy groceries. And you also see the horse drawn plow that was used there uh, to uh, lay down the permanent pastures after the stumps. Um, as a child, I used to love rummaging through the boxes in there because there were things like gunpowder in some of the boxes inside there, and it was great fun for a boy. And there's the uh, seed invoice, so some things haven't changed. Uh, 42 sacks at 100 pounds when the property was, uh, the size of the property was so down. Uh, 125 pounds of money to buy the four tons of seed. I can't resist slipping in a little bit of my background in Sarawak, three years there, maybe something you haven't seen before is a photograph of pepper production. So putting the post up on the left, the mature <coughs> lines in the middle, and the spikes of berries growing, and I've seen literally cubic metres of pepper forms waiting to go out to the world's kitchens. Uh, good fun. So, We've all got experiences like this. We heard some of them yesterday. They're precious, write them down, pass them on. They make us what we are, and uh, they give us a great platform to go forward on. The science of growing grass. Again, I've had to be impossibly selective uh, going through this. So, uh, unfortunately, we're in the McKinsey country, and I'm showing you rye grass. Forgive me for that. Uh, we do know that there are other kinds of grasses, but most of our research work and most of the sales are with ryegrass. For me in my career, one of the surprises was there was more to learn about the basic morphology of the plant. So my textbook as a university student showed a grass tiller like that, and you'll see the roots at the base look like um, uh, maybe a leek, the vegetable, with the roots just popping out anywhere, quite randomly. Uh, when we did the textbook with Lincoln University in the 1990s, uh, we drew the tiller quite differently, and I'll go now to a colour photo. So what you see is at the base of that shoot, there's young roots at the top, and old dead roots at the bottom, and if you get a microscope out, there's a segmental structure almost like a bamboo. And each of those segments starts with a leaf, and as the leaf dies, some roots form at that site. So you've got an age structure with turnover, just like we are now learning with the three-leaf model in the uh, managing dairy pastures. So the roots underground are doing something similar, except there's about 12 seconds with roots on. So the root cycle is about three times longer than the leaf cycle. Uh, so how I would think about roots now, uh, turn that uh, tiller base on its side and number the nodes from 1 to 12, going from left to right there. So the young ones at the top, uh, the, the light grey is construction energy, uh, the dark grey is maintenance energy, and the red line is the supply. So a bit like passing sweets around in the car, the first one gets the best one, and the second one gets the next best one, and the last one has to take what's left over. So the, su the supply of sugar uh, and substrates coming down from the leaves into the roots, uh, the young ones get well fed to grow with. Uh, by the time you're halfway down that stem, you're struggling to get enough for your maintenance and you're probably going to die of starvation. And that's not all. Uh, those are just the visible roots we can see. Of those in rye grass, there's about 70 kilometres per square metre of ground but we don't usually even investigate the root hairs and by some calculations on typical root hair dimensions. Um, if we factor in the root hairs, we would add to only 10% to the root mass because they are so small, but we will multiply the absorptive area by 10. So I don't think we really understand grass roots very well at all yet, although Jim Crush is doing a very good job of trying. And, uh, now, I wanted to say something about plant water, because it's a story less told. So I got my daughter to do this cartoon, some of you have seen it before. Uh, the little thing at the back is a ryegrass tiller, and he's having a tug of war with the soil to get some water out. Uh, so basically, in the summer, our plants are in a tug of war, uh, trying to pull water out of soil that doesn't want to give it up. 
Uh, we can measure that suction pressure that the plants are exerting by cutting a leaf off and putting it in a pressure chamber and winding up the pressure till sap flows out backwards through the cut end. We call that the leaf water potential. And there's another pressure. So I've drawn a diagram there of the water being sucked through the vascular system of the plant from the roots up to the leaves. Uh, the other one is the osmotic potential, so we have a different instrument to measure that. The, uh, yeah. I've got some data from a PhD student of mine that worked at AgriSearch with Jimmy Hartier and Chris Jones. So it just take a while to, uh, now my PhD students have been the joy of my life, they teach me so much. Um, they investigate my ideas, they do their own stuff as well. It's, it's just great to, uh, it's a privilege to have them. Uh, so in this diagram, uh, you've got eight cultivars that were market leaders when the ex experiment was set up in 2012. Um, yellow means endophyte plus, green means endophyte minus, and there's four months of a summer going through a dry down uh, in a rain out shelter. So top left is December, top right is February, bottom left is March. Then we gave them some water and uh, the bottom right is April. So you see the osmotic potential going from 12 atmospheres through 16 atmospheres in February, through 20 atmosphere in the middle of the drought in March and then back to 8 atmospheres. Now, just after rain, the plants need to exert almost no suction pressure at all to get the water out of the soil. Uh, first 5% of water, the soil moisture, they need about two atmospheres to get it out. The next 10%, they need about 10 atmospheres. Yes, really. Uh, when we put those leaves in the pressure chamber, we need 10 atmospheres of pressure to get the sap back out. Now, I asked my PhD student, Vishnu, who's talking tomorrow, to put some plants, uh, ryegrass plants in a real drought and to see what suction pressure they could draw down to. And uh, she's going to tell you the answer tomorrow as to what that is. Uh, yield is important in farming. Uh, when I started my career at Massey, the uh, news of the day was that the new cultivars from the Mummery strain of ryegrass, Nui and Illet, were more productive by about 15% than the flagship cultivar Rua Nui that had served as well since the 1930s. Um, those data there from a Grassland Association conference in 1983, uh, what's that, 35 years ago, heaven forbid, and uh, you'll see 23 tonnes for the Rua Nui over four years at Topo and 26 tonnes for Nui and Ella. Now, our Mark Osborne has been a part of the variety testing system for about 20 years now. Uh, as an indication of seed company investment, uh, we've charged the seed companies near a million dollars for doing those trials over those 20 years. So that's the sort of money and they're doing that all around New Zealand and uh, we don't take, make too much profit out there, but it helps our PhD students, and so there's a real networking benefit going on here. Now, we've noticed uh, Nui slipping down through the ranks as new cultivars come along. So if you look for Nui now, it's about fourth from the right uh, uh, if it's tested among a group of modern cultivars. So that's the plant breeding uh, benefit that's accrued over 40 years since the 1970s from the uh, breeding companies and if you want to see what that looks like there's a plot second from the top that's not quite responsive that's the Nui plot among the modern ryegrasses showing less summer drought growth. <coughs> now I know there are questions about Nui persistence but I don't think it's the genetics of Nui I think it's the increased stress in the modern farming system but that's another debate we have to have another time couldn't resist slipping this photo in. I can't remember whether this is the one Graham Kerr gave me from a, one of their trials at Darfield or whether it's the one that happened in our trial, but it happened twice. We had one of these variety trials just about ready for harvest. The glams got through the fence. Overnight they sampled. Having sampled, they knew what they wanted to eat. And across the four racks of the 
trial, they took one colour bar, the four lambs, and added to the ground, and that colour bar was Bealy. And yet, we don't have the understanding of palatability to breed for this at will, which surely we would if we could. Uh, change. I've decided to give a few slides of climate change. I don't know where this audience is up to on climate change. Uh, I've had a lot of uh, I'm a little bit cheeky, mischievous, so I find there's quite a few of my friends I can get wound up when I suggest I believe climate change is real, and you know, there's the other view out there that it's a scientific fraud. I asked my daughter two days ago what she thought about climate change, and she said, well, it's a self-evident fact. I thought, well, good for you, but not everybody thinks that, I know that. Um, here's the carbon dioxide curve. So the Americans since the 1960s have been measuring carbon dioxide off the Pacific Ocean at Mauna Loa and Hawaii. Um, when I was born, about 315 parts per million. About three years ago, it passed 400 parts per million. And uh, just earlier this year, it passed 410. So compared with the situation when I was new in my career, we are actually now living in a high carbon dioxide scenario that would have been an experiment in a growth chamber in the 1980s. It's now the reality of the atmosphere. Now that is predicted to increase the temperature. Uh, Google temperature spiral, spiral and you can get a nice picture um, from 1850 to the present time and the blues are in the 1850s and the yellows are now, so we're actually running about a degree warmer on average for the global temperatures. I see this all over the place. I see it in data from Burukura. I see it in data from the Tibetan Plateau. Um, didn't have time to show you some of those graphs. Uh, if you think, now the temperature data is hard to make sense of because it's up and down from day to day like a yo-yo. But now we've got things like the world wind map. If you don't know this one, Google it and go and have a look. It's such fun. Now, in the middle, uh, you can see Antarctica there with a northerly airflow. So if you're off the south of Australia, uh, you're having a bit of a cold air blast and you're thinking uh, climate change is bollocks because look how cold it is. Uh, but then look to the left and you can see that stream of air coming off continental Africa down to the left-hand side of Antarctic. So the fact is that for every cubic kilometre of air that comes north to us from Antarctica and makes us feel like climate change is not happening, somewhere else on the globe there's another cubic kilometre of air going south in the tropics. And if that air is a degree warmer than it used to be, then the um, the Antarctic ice shelf is going to slowly start melting. It might take a century or two, but uh, what we do see, I didn't have time to put it in, and the Arctic Ocean, uh, the predictions are you'll be able to sail your yacht to the North Pole in summer by about 2030. Uh, this, Tony Rhodes had a handle in this experiment, so Johnny was my PhD student. He came from Saba, and I've got a photo there of some nice Saba beef production. He wanted to capture New Zealand technology to enhance the beef industry in Saba. I suggested to him that the best, that he wouldn't transplant a New Zealand system to the tropics, so maybe he'd do a PhD in feed budgeting so he can optimise, understand system optimization. Now, what we found surprised us, he started feed budgeting New Zealand systems and the graphs there show the... So what he, Tony found us some, some farmers who were about to retire, who had diaries for their whole careers. So we, from the diaries, we were able to reconstruct the farm systems uh, in a model from 1980s through to the present time. And as we expected, the feed conversion efficiency improved over time. Farmers got better at turning grass into meat. But what we didn't expect was that the base productivity is going down by about 7% of the last 30 years. And when you delve into that and analyse what's going on, it is down to warmer, drier summers coming from climate change. 
and we have some farmers in the lower North Island who now uh, graze their hoggets off the farm in summer, sorry, in November, to have enough grass to grow the lambs, which they didn't used to have to do. So, uh, think. Now, thinking to the future, I, again with my mischievous element, I thought of an article, uh, of an item from Virtual Water, again, less talked about, but in my travels, it's become self-evident to me. So I've done 10 trips to China now, since 1986. It's been, again, a real privilege to work with the Chinese. Uh, one day as a reward for a lecture, they took me rafting on the Yellow River. So these are the sheepskin rafts you use. Bottom left, that's our raftsman. Bottom right, that's us on the Yellow River. So uh, I felt very vulnerable at that stage, and I was thinking to myself, well, um, as we sail towards those uh, earth cliffs that might fall at any time and create a tsunami across the, the rust, and cheerily told me the water was eight metres deep. And I was thinking to myself, well, at least I've got a life jacket on, and if they lost too many tourists, they wouldn't be allowed to do this, so I'll probably be okay. <laughs> um, the point about this little travel log picture is that during the 1990s, that Yellow River was running dry in the summer almost every year from a combination of low uh, rainfall and irrigation draw off. And then, and when I saw this map of virtual water flows, and it's showing that USA, now, here's the rub. To grow a kilogram of dry matter, the plant uses about a thousand liters of water and transpiration, give or take a couple of hundred. So, um, <coughs> 12 kilograms of dry matter to get a kilogram of milk solids. The amount of water wrapped up in producing that milk is absolutely massive. So what the Chinese realized, rather than try to be self-sufficient in food, we'll use our trade surplus to import the food and let other people use their water to generate it. And so that shows uh, virtual water flows out of USA into China. And uh, there's a graph I, in preparing for this talk, I found this recent analysis by a Chinese academic so shown in a scientific paper on the left and the graph on the right. So billion meters cubed per year virtual water import into China, going from uh, 50 billion in 2002 to 200 billion now. And when you look at the analysis of what they're saying about it, um, they're saying China relies too much on one crop in one country, that's soya bean from USA, and we need to diversify our water imports. And again, I didn't have time to show you, but if you go to the other side and look up um, the aquifers in the Midwest of the USA, like you can Google the Ogallala uh, aquifer, you'll find that uh, there's deep concern in USA right now that they're pumping down their aquifers faster. So the Ogallala aquifer is about 300 cubic kilometers uh, of water capacity. Uh, it's been pumped down at about 30 kilometers per year, so that gives you about 100 years supply. The recharge time for that aquifer is 6,000 years, and they're set to deplete it in 100 years. And that's the stability of our world food supply at the moment, uh, using fossil water out of USA uh, to save the Chinese from using their water. So I guess my message is we, we have to stop thinking about what's happening within the farm gate in New Zealand. We're a global community and we have to start being savvy about the context we work into because it will change the way we do things, I'm sure. Um, I thought, uh, just thinking outside the square, pastor agronomists shouldn't be talking about trade barriers, but hey, it makes a huge difference to the prices our farmers receive. So I rang up MPI to see what's the coming thing on uh, the market access work that they're doing. And I was surprised first by how hard it was to get any information from them. Uh, eventually, a man called Neil McLeod um, agreed to talk to me and uh, we had a bit of a discussion. So he said one key thrust we've got is we work to make sure under the World Trade Organization that any um, sanitary health measures that are put in place are really genuine and not uh, de facto trade barriers. 
And the other thing he said, there's a group of four industry bodies, and you can see them listed there, that we consult with about what uh, market access work is needed. So whereas I was expecting to come to you with a message of, hey, um, you know, look what MPI is doing for us, isn't it great? I, my thought after doing the homework is maybe we should be thinking about what MBI is doing for us in market access and talking to them a bit more about whether it's the right package for the future going forward. And as farmers and the industry, we have a stakeholding in that. Um, another privilege through being in China, Messi asked me to collaborate with a big university in Shanghai about the only common ground we at Massey had with their agriculture department was in ecotoxicology, basically pollution management. And two of the papers I helped them write that they gave me a co-authorship for were really revealing to me. So we know about cadmium residues in our industry. Uh, as the population pressure builds, they're a step ahead of us now. So this, this is a scenario of a chicken farm, of, of, a, of a grassland farm where there are cadmium residues from the fertilizer application and antibiotic residues from the chicken manure used as a fertilizer. And what was revealed in the research was that the cadmium was more toxic to earthworms uh, in the presence of the antibiotic residues than it was uh, if it was just cadmium without the antibiotic. So one of the things we have to look for going forward in the future is a combined effect of different trace pollutants rather than just any one in isolation. And you might say, isn't it a bit weird to be testing earthworms? Uh, in fact, they, we share our detox proteins with earthworms. They're pretty much identical, about a 95% homology, so it's quite amazing. Uh, another piece of work, I took it out because my talk was going to take too long if I didn't. Um, they were testing with um, exposure to uh, antibiotic residues the change in the proteins of the earthworms. So they tested about 5,800 proteins. Now that blew me away. <clears throat> I didn't realize our cells were a piece soup of proteins called, that's called the proteo. And in response to the antibiotic, about 35 of those 5,000 proteins changed their levels and uh, they did it uh, transiently, different changes at different times after exposure. And I thought that gives me a whole new perspective on, pro on problems like chronic fatigue because it shows that our bodies are so complex and it's so easy for a small imbalance to come in and so hard to understand what's going on when that happens. So in summary, I think we can be proud of our industry heritage. We should treasure it, record it, pass it on, uh, build on it. We saw some of it yesterday. I've shared a little bit more this morning. Um, at this conference, I've been blown away. I wanted to talk about the high lipid ryegrass, but as you see, I didn't have time to do that. Uh, great achievement from Ag Research, understanding the genetic code to the point that they can add in um, a gene to, to make the, the grass leaves have a higher energy and a protein to encapsulate the oil so the plant doesn't redigest it. Uh, talking to Ernst Roberts yesterday, what Ravensdown's uh, doing for the industry is just amazing. So you've got this great science happening all across the industry. We need it, we use it, it's our competitive edge going forward. Uh, and as I <coughs> have illustrated from the, some of those last examples, I think we have to move more and more to looking at the global context of what we do and not just how we get the product to the farm gate and hoping it will take care of itself from there forward. You know, we're stakeholders, we can look further. So that's me. Thank you very much, people. Um, the levy is a lovely medal, so um, 
We very much appreciate uh, you giving the talk and, and appreciate on behalf of us. And so you better point at the camera because you're going to be in the newsletter. <laughs> cool. So thank you very much, Corey. Cheers. Really well done. Thank you.